Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness unto light Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. So the subject of the four yogas, it covers the entire range of spiritual life. Um, one way of understanding the four yogas is this. See, the answer to spiritual life, the question of spiritual life depends on how one conceives of the problem. Karma yoga, the way of work or service. Bhakti yoga, the way of love, devotion. Raja yoga, the way of meditation. And jnana yoga, the way of knowledge. What is the problem and what is the solution? All of these are about spiritual life. In themselves, they are paradigms of spiritual life. In Karma Yoga, it is understood as the problem is selfishness and the solution is unselfishness. It is selfishness that ties us to this little body and mind, this little personality. So all the efforts that I do in life, all the work that I do, all my thoughts, everything through the days and months and years of my life is directed at making this happy. Why? Why this? Why particularly this? Because I am this. I am this. We never question it. It goes without question that I am this thing. I'm reminded of a couple of very interesting incidents. Today, I received an email from a doctor in Edinburgh. He says, all my life, I've never been particularly interested in spirituality or religion. Um, oncologist. Yet recently, just a few days ago, a few, a few, some time ago, what he did was, he says we are examining, I was looking at x-rays of the body, and then I thought, I can identify every bit of this body. Looking inside the body also, every bit of it, I know. I have studied it, I can identify it, I can actually see pictures taken by x-rays. And yet, where in all of this is I? It might, it might seem like a simple question, yet it struck him with a full force for the first time. In all of this, where is I, the one who is thinking now, the one who is enjoying suffering, huh? the one who I call myself, where am I in all of this? Each is a piece of this body. So that was his insight. Recently I was on a flight from Nova Scotia to Toronto and uh, in the seat next to me there was a young mother with her little daughter, baby daughter, Victoria. She was 17 months old and the mother was pointing out different things. We're just continuously talking to the child and pointing out different things and uh, naming it for the baby. One thing I understood is that babies uh, understand language much before they can speak. I think this is like common knowledge for any mother or, or father, but I never thought of that. They understand language. They understand what you are saying very clearly. Uh, just that they are babbling at that time. They can't actually talk. Uh, they can't pronounce clearly. So whatever the mother said, she understood, the baby Victoria. And she was, I think, fascinated by this color or something. So whatever her mother showed, she would turn around with big eyes and show me also. Like, <laughs> so look, there is a, there's a cloud in the window. Look, there's a plane. And she had a little soft toy. Look, that's Mr. Bear. Oh, that's relevant to bears, <laughs> Mr. Bear. And she would show, Victoria would show, with a big, big smile. 
And then the mother showed a picture of the baby, her own picture, the baby's picture on her mobile phone. Who's this? And the Victoria turned to me with big eyes and proud look and Hi. <laughs> now what struck me later, not at that time, later it struck me. It's a very Vedantic insight. What is the insight? When she is saying plane, that's a plane. Cloud, she's showing me, that is a cloud. Mr. Bear, this is Mr. Bear. But when she's shown the picture of baby Victoria, and she says this, she is not saying, this is baby Victoria. Like Mr. Bear, this is cloud, plane. She's saying, I am this. 17 months old. I am this. Do you see the distinction? Automatically, all the other things are this, 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 this. You should also say that picture is this. No, I, I. Automatically we identify with the body. And yet as the doctor saw, where in this body am I? Which one is me? Outside, which one is me? Inside with all the x-ray pictures, which one is me? So, we take this body and mind to be ourselves without question and Vedanta of course says this is wrong. And this is the root of samsara. And then we try our best throughout a lifetime to please this body. Give it the food it wants, give it the music it wants, give it the things it wants to see and all of the pleasing the senses. And then whatever is related to the body. My house, my property, um, my father, mother, my uh, husband, wife, child, grandchild, my. My means which my? This body. This is called selfishness. Sri Ramakrishna put it this way. He had an Im inimitable way of playing with words. He said, um, my nephew, my niece, this is called Maya. Mm -hmm. All are my Gopala, my, my baby Krishna is, everybody, my Krishna is appearing in all these forms. He says, this is called Daya. He's playing on the words Maya and Daya. Worldliness and spirituality. Look, the same people. This is mine and that's not mine. My nephew and my niece, my son, my daughter, and not mine. And just the opposite. All are my beloved Lord. So this movement from selfishness to unselfishness. Selfishness is the problem which traps us in samsara and unhappiness and unselfishness is the solution. This is the karma yoga paradigm. Bhakti yoga paradigm is our desire, all our attraction flows outward. This is nice. This is beautiful. I must have this. I must enjoy this. I must see that. The desire for sense objects is the problem. And the solution is to take all that desire and focus it on God. The desire is the same. I want. But the object has changed now. First is I want the world. Now it becomes I want. Same I want. But God. I want God. The world giving up, changing the focus to God. That is the bhakti yoga paradigm. The problem is all our passions, desires flow to the world and then turn the, that river around and focus it towards God. Same desire, same desire. Focus towards God, bhakti. That is the solution. That's the bhakti yoga paradigm. The raja yoga meditation paradigm is all my thoughts are scattered and about the world and because my thoughts are scattered, the truth is not, the spiritual truth is not revealed to me. The problem is, the Raja Yogi says, problem is not God, whether you want God or not, whether you're selfish or unselfish, the problem really is our minds are unsteady. They keep flickering. They keep, uh, they are scattered. If we would focus the mind, if we would only focus the mind, then the truth would be revealed to us. So from scattered mind to focused mind. 
from mind scattered in the world to mind gathered and focused on God, Atman, whatever you call it. From unmeditative mind to meditative mind. That is the problem and from there to the solution. That's the Raja Yoga paradigm. The Jnana Yoga, the way of knowledge, the, the, they say the, the paradigm is, the problem is ignorance. We do not know what we are, who we are right now, right here. And this is called ignorance. And the solution to ignorance is knowledge. So from ignorance to knowledge, the Jnana Yoga paradigm. From scattered mind to concentrated meditative mind. Raja, uh, first was Jnana Yoga paradigm. Second one is Raja Yoga paradigm. From mind, desires pouring out into the world to desires all concentrated on God. Bhakti Yoga paradigm. From, a, from selfishness, scattered in a hundred selfish pursuits for this one body and mind. The, all the activities are now channelized unselfishly. That is the Karma Yoga paradigm. Of course, I am giving you a general case, very oversimplified version. We will go slowly into the depth of it. So right now the discussion is on Karma Yoga. Uh, this, this session and the next one. Now, Karma Yoga has some, something unique. First of all, of all the yogas, this is the only one which is not private. Yeah. Your meditation, your devotion, all your philosophy, it's all up, it's yours really doesn't have too much to do with me. I may get the fruits of it when you're fairly well along the path, but otherwise, not much to do with me. But karma yoga is engaged with the world, with, with, with the public. So your karma yoga is that spiritual path which is directly in contact with the world. Another fact is, in today's world, work is very important. All of us. Whether you are in ashram or in a family or in a workplace, you are active. You are doing things. You are coming in contact with people. We are coming in contact with problems. Now this takes so much time and energy that if we cannot spiritualize our work life, then spirituality is a losing proposition. It will always lose. If we clearly make a distinction, my secular life and my spiritual life, then out of 365 days, how many days retreat, Star Lake retreat? Three days. 362 days? What about the other 362 days? Not spiritual. To 24 hours in a day, how many hours are spiritual? Maybe at the most half an hour? Busy days, then five minutes, ten minutes? And the rest, a good deal of it is spent in sleep and the rest is spent in like Manhattan, the city that never sleeps. I saw, saw a poster. Manhattan, the city that never sleeps, but always dreams. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's a good one. She's saying it's a good one. <laughs> I'm sure somebody in Wall Street must have come, or some Madison Avenue, somebody must have come up with it. Yeah. So, Spirituality will always lose if you do not spiritualize your whole life. Our energy, time, concerns are mostly with the world, mostly with work. Only a little is left over for spirituality. One Swami told me, if you cannot spiritualize your work, then you are a vagabond. As a monk, when I first came to the ashram, what are you doing? Other people out there in the world, they are earning money, they are, um, they are doing, uh, uh, they are working, they are raising families. What are you doing? See, you are working in a school or a hospital and all, if, if that's not spiritual, if that's not connected to your goal of God realization, then why are you doing it? Others are doing it, the doctor is doing it because he earns money, the teacher is doing it because he earns money, he takes care of his family. Why are you doing it unless you can spiritualize it? So work has to be spiritualized. Otherwise, this, different, this distinction between secular and spiritual, it, it's, uh, karma yoga erases that. It makes everything spiritual. It makes everything spiritual. So we're going to talk about karma yoga. There's a lot to learn. And I'm going to, they call it an info dump. So I'm going to tell you a lot of things. Remember, if you have any short specific questions, I can... I can answer right away, otherwise we'll keep it till the end of the class.
I'm primarily going to be using Swami Bhajanandaji's book. He wrote a little monograph about it, a very spiritual, saintly, um, very uh, illumined, very intellectual monk of our order. So his work is based mostly on Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yoga. I think we have copies of it here. Yes. So that's the standard work to go to. Swami Vivekananda, it was his uh, favorite yoga, you might say. He gave great emphasis on Karma Yoga. Great emphasis on Karma Yoga. So we'll see uh, more and more why. So first, so I'm going to give you several points, one after another, today and tomorrow in the morning. There's a lot to understand here, a lot to clarify. Because Karma Yoga, we don't think much about it. But yet it's so important for us. Especially in Manhattan, in the United States, in America, in the 21st century, in advanced countries of the world. I was in Boston day for yesterday, and this um, Uber driver, he, is from, he said he's from Liberia. And I said, do you ever go to your country? He said, every year. And he was a very funny, nice uh, young man. He said, I go there to relax. I work here. Here you can't work, you know. Here you can't relax, you know, man, you can't relax here. Yeah. And then he says, you go to Liberia, man, you just let it go for some time. Why all this? <laughs> so when you are working so much and you cannot, um, you cannot not work, if you, if, you do, if you do that, if you try to do that by force, you will end up feeling guilty. You will end up feeling uneasy in this, this economy, in this society. So how do you spiritualize work? So karma. So let's um, get into it. I've got actually some notes and stuff. That's why I wanted this. Karma translates into work, but here's the thing, not all work. The moment we say work, there are different meanings of that word. So, for example, physics, motion is related to work. All motion, there's so much motion going on in, in uh, nature. The sun and the moon and the, uh, even the river and the wind, motion is going on. Is that work? No. Machines are doing some, in fact, there are formula we learned in physics classes as kids, calculate the work done in uh, energy units and all. Is that karma? No. Karma is that which is done by a living being, in a living body. So karma is, the word karma as it occurs in karma yoga relates to one, work done by a living being in a living body, sentient being, that work. Second, it's consciously done work. There must be a sense of agency, a sense of a feeling of, I am doing it. So my um, tummy has, is now busy digesting the food we just ate. Is that karma being done? No, no, no. So I am doing it consciously. Agentship must be involved there. Third, there must be results for which we are working towards. So there is bhoktritva. Bhoktritva means the enjoying, literally it's Karma is katritva, agentship, and bhoktritva means it is translated as enjoyership, but it's not actually enjoyer. It can also be suffering, mostly it is suffering. So, <laughs> the work that we do, it comes, the results that come from that work, we enjoy and suffer that. So that also is a part of, a part of what we mean by karma here. A machine does a lot of work, but it's neither enjoying nor suffering. Neither enjoying nor suffering. Even a computer, which does intelligent work, deep blue beats a chess grandmaster. And the chess grandmaster who played hard to win and loses is feeling, feeling disappointed, depressed, and humiliated. But deep blue does not feel triumphant and joyful. No. So is it beyond triumph and joy, beyond depression? Is it a perfect karma yogi? No, the term karma does not apply to what Deep Blue is doing. It applies to what the Grand Master is doing. So there, is, there has to be agentship in Sanskrit kartritva. There has to be enjoyership, sufferership, I don't know, I'm coining new words. <laughs> Enjoying and suffering, bhoktritva. Then there must be um, w what is called the cosmic result uh, that uh, by doing this karma I get some result see 
Number four, you write down moral obligation. Karma has a moral dimension. Good, bad, righteous, unrighteous. These things become involved. So, for example, a baby might consciously do something, but what the baby is doing is not, um, not good or bad. When the baby is very young. Animals do many things, but you don't call the cops on the animal which creates a nuisance. Nor do you give a... Although they give medals to dogs nowadays for bravery in war and all of that. But generally good and bad, um, a, moral, a moral obligation, a sense of that there is a moral dimension in karma, which need not be there in all kinds of activities of work. So moral dimension is two parts. Morality, good, bad, and freedom of choice. If, you, if we think a little bit, we will realize quickly that without freedom of choice, without free choice, you cannot have good and bad. You cannot praise a person for action, good action done consciously, or you cannot blame a person for evil done consciously unless that thing was done freely. If the person is forced to do something bad, you cannot really blame that person. If that person unknowingly does something great, you cannot really praise that person. So moral dimension is there. And moral dimension means, one is that there must be good and bad involved in that, and the second is there must be freedom of choice. Karma, another idea. And the last one is what is called cosmic result, karma phala. This is usually the way karma is understood in Sanskrit and in Indian languages. You say, when my karma is bad, what do you mean my karma is bad? What, we understand that the results of our past karma are what we are experiencing now. The law of karma, the law of karma states, good, good, bad, bad. Swami Vivekananda's poem, Song of Sanyasin, good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. None escape the rule? The law. But whosoever wears a form wears the chain too. So good, good, good karma leads to Good results. Good results means pleasant things tend to happen to you. Bad karma, remember in the sense of consciously done immoral action. Bad karma leads to unpleasant things happening to us. So good, good, bad, bad and none escape the law. Whosoever wears a form, this, a body, wears the chain to. What is the chain? The chain is this fifth aspect of karma I'm talking about, the cosmic result. We have existed in past lives, we have done many things and the results are upon us now. So that is called our past karma. We are what we are now because of many lives. So babies, they are not, not new creatures. If you look into the eyes of a baby, you see an ancient creature staring at you, at, out at you. <laughs> so we come with a lot of, lot and lot of baggage. Um, let me write it down quickly. Yes. Yes. Um, my understanding is that it's good doesn't necessarily mean that you will get a good result in life, but in your own, uh, in your own mind or in Correct. Right? Because you keep that in mind because we will take it up later. Okay. That's there. What are the results of karma? That's a point I'm going to come to just a little later. But right now, I'm just clarifying the word karma. So we see five points. Living being, not a machine. This distinguishes the word karma we use in karma yoga from so the word work in, in um, science and uh, all, uh, many other things you can use. Then agency, kartritva. Then suffering, enjoying, I'm using the Sanskrit word, bhoktritva. Bhoktritva, it means enjoying and suffering. Then there is moral dimension, which includes choice. Oh, this is very, very good idea, placing the microphone here. I could spend the whole day here. <laughs> um, moral dimension. I was just reminded the f famous French philosopher Foucault, Michel Foucault, uh, he talked about the Greek idea of paresia. Paresia means truth-telling. 
the Greek, ancient Greeks had a very interesting idea. Parasia means truth telling. What is truth telling? So Foucault explains that the sun rises in the east. So this is a fact. I've told the fact. Is it truth telling? He says, no, this is not the idea of truth telling. When I tell a truth which is harmful to my perceived interests, my own selfish worldly interests, it's true. But if I tell it, I might be exposed to harm. Then I've told the truth. Sri Ramakrishna says something similar. He says, if a man can confess to his faults simply, openly, then one must understand there is some spiritual substance in the man. In Bengali he said, Je lok nijer dosh pot pot kore bole dite pare, bujhte hobe tar moddhe kichu ache. So, moral dimension is there, and including choice. And this other one, the real thing which most people understand by karma, a result which will come to us in life. Cosmic result. This is what most people mean in India when they talk about karma. In Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. By the way, this karma, this idea of karma, good, good, bad, bad, um, consciously done good leads to good results in this life or the next. Consciously done evil leads to bad results in this life or the next. This is something accepted by all the Indian religions. Hinduism, all varieties of Hindus who do not agree on almost anything else. They, I often introduce Hinduism in schools in America when they're asked about Hinduism. I say that any question that you may ask about Hinduism, the answer is usually yes and no. <laughs> Belief in God? Yes. And no, there are philosophies. God is male, yes, and no. The song which pa uh, Patrick sung at the beginning, Shakoli Tomari Icha, All is Thy Will, is sung to God as the mother, divine mother. God has form, yes, and no. But there is something that all Hindus, if they call themselves Hindus, believe in. That is karma. And associated with that, multiple lives, existences, before this birth, after this. And all Buddhists who do not believe in an eternal soul, who do not believe in God, but they believe in karma. Buddhists believe in karma. They believe in many lives. Jains. So all uh, Indian philosophies believe in this cosmic result. Why do I say belief? Notice one thing. All these are not really controversial. Yeah, if you think about it, they are all, we, we know this. But this one is, it's a matter of belief, faith. There is a component of faith here. Because there are people who will say, no, I don't know. How do I know that I had past lives? How will I know? Maybe not. So anyway, this whole thing was a clarification of the term karma. Let's go ahead now. So what is karma yoga? Now we come to karma yoga. Dharma, religion, has two broad aspects in Hinduism, in Vedanta. Pravritti and Nivritti. Swami Vivekananda said there's no good English translation for them, but the nearest he can say is Pravritti means circling outwards, going out, flowing into the world. And nivritti means circling inwards, turning inwards. Basically, um, what I sometimes call religion and spirituality, or the higher religion and the lower religion. So pravritti means engaging with the world, going out into the world, but doing it ethically. And that's religion. Mass religion is like that, basically. And nivritti is turning inwards, seeking the transcendental, not interested in worldly pursuits anymore. So that is the higher spirituality. One would be, I want um, pleasure, and I want success, and I want to be rich. But how can religion help me here? Belief in God, belief in karma, being ethical and moral. This is the sustainable way to live in this world. This is a good way to live in this world, moral and ethical way. You cannot have a society without this. You cannot have an organization without this. You cannot have a family without this. So that is called pravritti. And most religion, 
churches, temples, mosques, they're all basically teaching this. Ethical life, good life. Then there is a, there is a secret, esoteric, inner dimension, the core of spirituality. That there is something beyond this world, even a moral life, even a good life, beyond this also there is something higher to be achieved. Call it nirvana, moksha, God realization. All mystics, saints, sages, bodhisattvas, whom avatars, who, they, that was the core teaching. Every scripture of the world, the core teaching is this. In every religion. The core, the essential teaching is there is something beyond even the moral life, even the ethical life. Ethical life and moral life is preparation for this higher spirituality. So, pravritti and nivritti. Shankaracharya, in his introduction to the Bhagavad Gita, he starts the introduction by saying this Dvividu hi Vedokta Dharmaha. Pravritti lakshana, nivritti lakshana scha. The Vedic religion is twofold. First sentence. Vedic religion is twofold. One is the path of pravritti. One is the path of nivritti. Path of nivritti. Now, why am I saying this? The work that is done in the path of pravritti is karma. It's not karma yoga. Karma yoga entirely belongs to the path of nivritti. Karma yoga is, is a yoga. The purpose is God realization, moksha, nirvana, freedom, enlightenment. The karma that is the work that is done in the path of pravritti is moral action, ethical action. Yes, the goal is still to, uh, is still your eyes are on the bottom line of the company. But how to, what is taught in um, B school, business school? Not how to attain enlightenment. But business ethics, business ethics teaches you how to do business, attain your goals, but ethically. Without cheating people, without destroying the economy and destroying the company. When the economy collapsed the last time, and it won't be the last time, <laughs> when the economy collapsed the last time, there was an article, as usual, in Time magazine, and said that actually we all know what happened. At the core of it is, is um, not a systemic failure. Every time it happens, they try to fix it by changing the laws and all of that. And the guys who break the laws are smarter. They'll find another way of breaking the law. They said it's greed. And the, the form of that greed, they said in Wall Street, there's a saying, YBG, IBG. YBG, IBG means... You will be gone, I will be gone. <laughs> let's do this, let's make our millions. Company will collapse, Wall Street will collapse, then the American economy will collapse, along with that the rest of the world economy will collapse, fine. But we will be, we'll be retiring with millions of dollars. Now this, this is um, adharmic karma. This is also pravritti, but it's done unreligiously, um, immorally. How can you live a good life morally? That is pravritti. That is karma, dharmika karma. But it is called sakama karma, karma done with desire. How to do it morally? Religion teaches you that. Every religion teaches you that. But the nivritti marga, the higher religion, spirituality, what is the role of karma there? There karma becomes karma yoga. Okay. So this distinction. Then another distinction, one, one just uh, basic errors. This uh, is more common in India. All people who do a lot of work are not karma yogis. They may do a lot of karma, but they're not necessarily karma yogis. Why? In India, you, I don't know if it's still there, but you'd see advertisement, obituary. One great businessman has died. Uh, Said so and so, X, Y, Z. He has passed away. Bhut bade karma yogi the. He was a great karma yogi. He established a multi-million dollar business. Now, that's said as a praise of that person, but that's a misnomer. He, he was a great worker, no doubt. I'm sure he was a great entrepreneur. I'm sure he was a workaholic. I'm sure he earned millions of dollars, but, or, or crores of rupees. But that's not karma yoga. So that's one error. Second error is everybody can be karma yogi. No, no, no. Karma yoga also requires preparation. It's, it's a spiritual practice like everything else. You only have to look at the life of Mahatma Gandhi in this country, Martin Luther King, or uh, in, our, in India, Vinoba Bhave, and many others. An ascetic lifestyle with moral and ethical training, uh, a high spiritual goal in life, 
with engagement with the world. So not, it's not easy to become a karma yogi. Uh, that um, meditation is difficult. And I fall asleep when I meditate. I'd rather be a karma yogi. Not easy. Bhakti yoga is difficult. I really don't have any faith in God. I'd rather do karma yoga. Not easy. Jnana yoga is difficult. Uh, it's what they are talking about in jnana. It's not very clear. Karma yoga is easy. No. All right. So karma yoga also requires preparation. Let me go ahead. Okay. A quick note on what Shankara and Vivekananda thought of karma yoga. Adi Shankaracharya, you know of the Advaita Vedanta. Yes. Or am I giving trouble to the poor camera? <laughs> Running around here and there. Adi Shankaracharya, you know, um, I'm going to summarize his position very quickly. He is often regarded as a person who criticized or downplayed karma, um, even karma yoga. That's true and not true. Let's see. Shankara and Vivekananda on karma yoga. This is the thing. This will be familiar to many people who come to the Vedanta Society. From Adi Shankara's perspective, what is spiritual practice? It's this matrix. You remember the problem solution method? Mr. Uh, yeah. So, problem. Solution and method. Very quickly, do any of you remember? First problem? Ignorance. Mm, I see that repetition has a value. <laughs> <laughs> Ignorance. In, um, and the solution is, of course, knowledge. Yes. And the method is? Jnana Yoga, Shravana Manana Nididhyasana, Jnana Yoga, the method of Jnana Yoga. And uh, then the next level of pro problems is um, the scattered mind. Unfocused mind, which is a big problem today. Uh, even in Harvard University, I see all these brilliant kids, but they are always on there. No, I'm being unfair. Almost nobody was on there. But maybe they were a little overawed to be on uh, in Harvard, but very soon they'll get back on their uh, mobiles and all. Scattered mind. And the solution is focus. Method is Raja Yoga. Who says? Adi Shankaracharya. Shankara's approach. Raja Yoga. Meditation. He will even put bhakti here. Because it gives you focus on God, in that sense only. And then third and last bottom level of uh, problems, impure mind. Solution, no-brainer, pure mind. <laughs> Method, here we are, karma yoga. So this is in Sanskrit, Chitta Mala, pure mind, Chitta Shuddhi, Chitta Shuddhi means purification of the mind. With Karma Yoga, mind is purified, impure mind is removed and you get a pure mind. With the pure mind, you meditate and a scattered mind is concentrated, you get a focused mind. With the pure mind, as in Sanskrit, vikshepa, ekagrata in Sanskrit. Ekagrata means focus. So, with focused mind and pure mind, when you come to jnana yoga, knowledge will come. This is in Sanskrit, jnana is knowledge. And it removes ajnana, ignorance. What happens then? You realize that I am Brahman. And the problem is solved. You were Brahman anyway. 
You didn't know it. You need to know it. You try to know it, doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Mind is scattered. Rajasika mind, when you come to Gyan Yoga, it's scattered and thinks of so many things. I often have this experience when I'm teaching Vedanta. I tell you Drik Drishya Viveka, the method of the seer in the scene, or the method of the analysis of the five sh levels of the human personality. And then somebody or the other will say, Swami, can I understand it in terms of space, time, energy, and this? Something else he has read somewhere, that comes in. Maybe, at some time, you can think about it later, but first learn what's being taught here. Don't bring in your, your theories right now. So, um, then, then the, so, so for mind is scattered because of rajas. If the mind has so much tamas, then what will happen is, Upanishad class, Jnana Yoga, going on, teacher is teaching. And then uh, uh, in Uttarakhand, there's suddenly some faint humming sound is coming somewhere. <laughs> and this monk who's teaching, he says in Hindi, he says, Are Mishra ji, kya hua? Mishra ji, what happened? And he gets up like this, Tanik samadhi lag gai thi, the little, <laughs> little, a little samadhi, I had a little samadhi. That is tamasic mind, falling asleep. The moment you start, it does off. It's an occupational hazard, of, I've discovered, of being a student. I'm on this side, but I'm now getting the experience of sitting on your side, so I have all sympathy. <laughs> uh, so, focus is required, otherwise scattered mind, unable to grasp. That is not working, again, that is also not working. Why? Mind is full of desires. Mind is being pulled away from interiorizing. So that purity is required. And that's where Shankaracharya gives Karma Yoga. Notice, Shankaracharya does not say Karma Yoga will give you enlightenment. I am Brahman by Karma Yoga. No, no, no. Karma Yoga, then Bhakti or Raja Yoga, meditation, basically. The word he likes is not Raja Yoga. Shankaracharya does not use this. Again, difficult to say. See, this is the problem of going to school. You have to be careful about what you say because otherwise, um, just yeah, yes, day before yesterday, and they were saying in the classroom, every word you say, you have to justify. You have to defend every word you put down. So there is actually a place where Shankaracharya uses the word Raja Yoga. It doesn't matter. Uh, he likes the word Upasana. He likes the word Karma. Upasana, jnana. These are the words he uses. So, um, by these practices, by karma, purity of mind, chitta shuddhi, by upasana, concentrated mind, then by jnana yoga, you come to the Vedanta teaching and then you'll become enlightened. But in contrast to this, Vivekananda says, do it by work, do it by love, do it by meditation, do it by philosophy. He uses the word philosophy in his original description. By one or more or all of these and be free. Yeah. Is he doing something strange? Is he going against Shankara? Not necessarily. Because if you go to a, one of the later masters, Vishishta Dvaita of Ramanuja, he also says all of these are necessary, but Ramanuja, he changes the order. Karma Yoga, always the the poor guy at the bottom. And then he puts Jnana Yoga. And then Ramanuja puts Bhakti Yoga at the top. By Karma Yoga, preparation, purification of the mind, the usual function. And then by Jnana Yoga, you realize, I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am a spark of divine consciousness. And then by Bhakti, you rela uh, relate this individual spark of consciousness to the Supreme Consciousness. Uh, Jivatma to Paramatma. That's your relationship with God. The Ramanuja puts it that way. All of the Acharyas, they say that uh, all the yogas are necessary. They don't reject the yogas. Basically, practically, it boils down that we must do all of the yogas. Again, exception. So, in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, if you go to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the teachers of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, they will actually say that no, no, no. All of them are not necessary. Bhakti alone is enough to do everything. 
So, with that proviso. So here is the difference. Swami Vivekananda gives a lot of emphasis on Karma Yoga. It comes from the way he teaches Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta, to put it very simply, uh, can be taught in one way is that um, by emphasizing the falsity of the world to show the reality of Brahman or by emphasizing the oneness of the world. That also shows the reality of Brahman. How? Remember the classic snake rope example? Rope is false. Rope is true. Snake is false. That's the result of having a heavy dinner. <laughs> so, rope is true. You understand what example I'm talking about? Snake rope. So, rope is true. Snake is false. You can say that the snake is false, one. Or you can say snake is nothing other than the rope. So the snake is really the rope. Or even so far as to say the snake is real as the rope. Now what is, what have I, why are we talking about snakes and ropes here? Rope stands for Brahman, the ultimate reality. Snake stands for the world which we think is real. We thought the snake was real. When we investigated it, it turned out to be a rope. We think that this is the reality. When we investigate this, ourselves and the world, it turns out to be nothing other than Brahman. Often I indiscriminately use the word God. Some people objected. This is not technically correct. But I don't want to be technically correct because they are all referring to the same reality. One must at, at times make it a little fuzzy. Because if you make too many distinctions between Atman, Brahman, uh, the god of uh, religion and the god of different religions, you, you create an impression in the minds of people, you're talking about many different things. You're not actually. There is only one thing all religion is trying to point out. Okay. Um, so, Swami Vivekananda, Shankara is approximately, uh, put, it, put it, he is the person who is saying, snake is false. Jagat Mithya, the world of appear, it's an appearance. And hence, Brahman is real. Swami Vivekananda is saying, the snake is nothing other than uh, the rope. The world is nothing other than God. See God in everything, in everybody. And it's true. It's true. Our whole problem is, we think, I am this much and everything else is separate from me. Shankara says, all that is separate from you, put everything into that separateness. The world is separate from you, but the body is also not you. The mind is also not you. When you put it all away like that, then you discover the real you within, and you see everything else is an appearance. So that is reality. Brahman is real, the world is an appearance, and you are none other than Brahman. Karma plays a secondary, very secondary role there. But Swami Vivekananda says, the world is also nothing other than Brahman. You are also nothing other than Brahman. And all of these people are also nothing other than Brahman. And you can engage, work is also nothing other than Brahman. Truly understood, your activities in the world can be and should be spiritualized. Bhagavad Gita, take the, take the verse we chant before food. Brahma arpanam brahma vi, brahma agno brahma nautam, brahma evatena gantavyam, brahma karma samadhina. Brahman is the offering. Brahman is the, the, the uh, fire into which you offer. Uh, Brahman is the priest who makes the offering. Brahman is the action of offering. One who sees Brahman in all action. It does not say one who regards all action as false. It says one who sees Brahman in all action. That one attains to Brahman. That's what Swami Vivekananda is emphasizing. And don't, don't think that he is... Uh, he is deviating from traditional Advaita Vedanta. Ramana Maharshi, who is a very staunch Advaitin, one of the, taken as the um, epitome of modern Advaita, he says in one place, who can say the world is real? Our immediate response would be, we say we are ignorant people, we think the world is real, the great enlightened people think the world is false. He says, no, no, no. It is only the enlightened person can, who can say the world is real. The enlightened person can say the world is real. Our saying the world is real has no value at all. We do not know what reality is. The enlightened person realizes Brahman, the reality, and sees that everything is Brahman. That is the real world. What we live in is like a dream. But we are all talking about the same thing. 
I hope I've confused you enough. So this is the difference between Swami Vivekananda's approach. So Swami Vivekananda now regards the world as an appearance or as nothing other than Brahman, not real in itself. But if you know it truly, for the one who truly understands it, the world is actually a shining forth, a manifestation of Brahman. Just as every ornament is actually expressing golden ornament, expressing the gold within. Every wave is basically an expression of the water. In the same way, everything in this world is an expression of God. So Sri Ramakrishna's teaching, Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva, serve all beings knowing them to be Shiva. That becomes the basis for Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yoga. Serve all beings knowing them to be Shiva. Shiva means God. Knowing them, not thinking about them, not believing them to be Shiva, knowing them to be Shiva. As just as you know that the waves are nothing but water, the ornaments are nothing but gold, all beings are nothing but God. So that's Vivekananda and Shankara in Karna Yoga. Okay, I'll make one more point quickly, and then we'll take a few questions. You have a question? Yeah. Quick clarification. Mm. Yes, you, you have to be, in order to know that. So until then you have to kind of believe. Until then you have to believe, yes. How do we proceed? How do we proceed? In the path of bhakti, we take it on faith. Bhakti is a path of faith. I mean, that's why I say, in one sadhu in Uttarakhand said, there are only two ways. Either you believe or you know. In Hindi, jano ya mano, dohi raste hain. Either you believe it or you know it. Now, in most of the world, especially Western world in USA, religion is taken as faith. The word, in fact, the word used for religion in USA is faith. But you know, it, that is an uneasy word for thing, something like Buddhism. Buddhism is not faith in that sense. It's an uneasy word to apply to yoga, for example, Patanjali yoga. We see, we'll see Raja yoga. And definitely it's, a, it's not an appropriate word to apply to Advaita Vedanta. It's a path of knowing. Now, until you say, no, but until you know, you have to believe. No, not in the sense that you believe in other, other religions. It's more like when you go to college, you go to a teacher. I give this example many times. What, how, what is our attitude to what the teacher is teaching in a physics class or a math class or somewhere? Our attitude is, the teacher is telling the truth. The textbooks are correct. I don't get it yet. Let me work at it, I'll get it. And the purpose is to get it. The purpose is not to believe it. Because see, if the teacher tells you something and says, do you get it? And if you say, I don't understand, but you are great, I believe you. <laughs> teacher is not going to be happy at all. You, see, you have to understand it. That is the difference between the path of jnana and the path of bhakti. So in the path of jnana, the, always the effort is to understand. In the path of bhakti, you'll be told, there's no point in trying to understand now. Believe it and live accordingly and it will be shown to you in time. Usually after post-mortem, after death. Okay. Um, one more point quickly and then I'm done. Are there snacks after 8.30? And, and are they available for some time or will they disappear? <laughs> oh, 30 minutes, so I should not take too much time. Okay, that, um, the effects of karma. Sorry, yes. What do you mean by jano yamano? Jano yamano. What do you mean by that? Mano means believe it. God exists. If karma exists. After death, you will continue to exist. Before birth, you were there. How do I know that? If you say, no, you don't know it. You have to believe it. That's one path. Most religion is like that. Another path is, that I am not the body and mind, this actually can be understood, not, not believed. So jnana yoga is the path of understanding it. Jano means jnana, knowledge. It's not a question of believing it. You have to understand it. The effort is continuously to understand it. And it can be understood. The whole point is that we do not understand. And the point is to understand it. 
The problem is we don't understand. The solution is to understand. Remember, understanding is not the end of it. That understanding has to deepen into enlightenment or realization. But understanding is part of it. The other path, understanding is not so much important. Doing it is important. Karma yoga. In bhakti yoga, doing or understanding is not in that, that much important. Believing, having faith is important. So, different paradigms. Just to address your point, karma has three effects. Karma, action has three effects in the, in the sense we mean karma. What are the three effects? One is the immediate effect. You give food to a hungry person, the hungry person is fed and the hunger is removed. Direct effect, everybody sees it. No question about it. Second is what you said, an effect on your own mind. Keep doing it and you develop the good habit of sharing, the joy of doing things for others. Psychological effect, it's called samskara. Third one is karma phala, which we talked about here. In Sanskrit, papa punya, merit, demerit, which will result in some pleasant or unpleasant effect, sukha dukkha. So the law is like this, dharma, good action, consciously done, leads to punya. These are words which are used by just about every Indian, but we use it unthinkingly. Dharma leads to punya. Punya means merit. Merit leads to sukha, happiness. So the meaning is all good things which are happening to us now are because of some merit we have. And that we earned in earlier lives. But equally, all the unpleasant things happening to us, nobody's fault. It's we who have generated it. We've set in motion mighty energies, though subtle, in some ancient time, and the result we are getting now. So, adharma leads to papa. Papa means sin or demerit. And papa leads to dukkha. And they are all limited. Consciously done good action generates some limited amount of merit. That generates some limited amount of nice things. Similarly. So, and that's why there is no unlimited heaven or unlimited hell. Uh, there are limited heavens and limited hells. And they are all worldly. This worldly, that worldly, but all worldly. They are not spiritual. Spirituality is freedom from all of this. Freedom from the whole mess. Worldly mess and other worldly mess. Worldly mess is called this. And other worldly mess is that. That stands for heaven and hell. Both are mess. <laughs> and freedom from this causality is... So Swami Vivekananda's um, poem... Good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law, but whosoever wears a form, wears the chain too. This much is karma. Then what is Vedanta? Far beyond name and form is Atman ever free. Know thou art that. Say Om Tat Sat. Uh, now thou art that sannyasi bold, say Om Tat Sat. So on that beautiful note, let's end. Those, you want to... Let me do a Shanti chant, and those who want to grab a quick snack, yeah. we'll, we'll, I'll wait for questions, don't worry. But we don't want the snacks to run away. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Yes. Yes, or you can pass the microphone or you can come up here and ask the question. And others, please feel to um, leave. Question? Life is only real when I am, yes. My own, re just repeat the comment. Uh, just the comment was that uh, Gurdjieff has a book uh, named Life is Only Real When I Am. Very deep point. Yes, the question. So, um, can you explain it a little bit more? The difference between bhokta and cosmic result? Is this bhokta, is this this life you enjoy? It or is bhokta means bhoga, that means to experience. Bhoga can be of two types. Bhoga means to experience, to get, to have some experience. It could be a pleasant experience, which is called ishta, which means desirable experience. An unpleasant experience, pain and um, disease and uh, unhappiness and failure. 
So it's called anishta, undesirable experience. But both are bhoga. And I am the bhokta. The moment I say, I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I touch. So I suffer, I enjoy, I am bhokta. And for that, I do work to get the desirable bhoga, the objects of enjoyment, and to avoid undesirable experiences. This is called bhoktritva. So karma is connected with bhoktritva. Yeah, but the, even the cosmic result is the same thing, isn't uh, no, it? No, cosmic result is by doing karma, these, these experiences come to me. The bhoga comes to me. The bhoga is generated by the cosmic result. Bhoga is the thing which you experience. The thing will come to you, pleasant and unpleasant things, desirable and undesirable things will come to you, and you will experience it, I will experience it. So I am the bhokta, but the thing which I experience, that is the cosmic result, that is generated by my past karma. So all the things that we experience, it comes to us because of our past karma. And these are not good things. None of the whole thing is not good news at all. <laughs> From a spiritual point of view, this is samsara. This is what we are trapped in endlessly. And to expand beyond this into our infinite nature is freedom. Yes. Uh, Swamiji, I'm confused about what you said about Shankaracharya's teaching, the cause and effect. Does the, does the karma yoga purify your mind or does purifying your mind make you a karma yogi? No. Karma yoga, when you practice karma yoga, purifies the mind. We can immediately see why. What is the essence of this kind of impurity? It's selfishness. So trying the best to, my, or my level best to make this particular body happy. Why am I trying to make it happy? As Victoria said, I am this. Obviously I will try to make it happy because I am this. But Vedanta insists you are not this. Fatal error. One day this body will age and decay and die in spite of our best efforts. And I am gone also. No, that's the problem. You will still be there. You will suddenly realize, huh, I spent my lifetime taking care of the car. Now the car is broken and gone, I'm still there. I should have used the car for my purposes. But I lived my life trying to take care of the car. And I'm, this is from a famous science fiction story written in the 60s, 50s. Report on planet 3 or something. An alien has come and sees uh, this planet. And we, it, it never mentions Earth. But uh, it sends a report back to its home planet. I found an uh, inhabited planet inhabited by intelligent and powerful beings. Here is a report. These intelligent and powerful beings who inhabit this land, this, this planet, they are shiny, made of metal, and they have four wheels. And they have, a, uh, they have servants whom they carry within themselves. And those servants clean them, feed them, maintain them, they do everything for them. That is a commentary on the car culture in 1950s, 60s in the U.S. when it was booming. Very intelligent science fiction story. I'll come to you. Let me let her ask first. I'll come back to you. You had a question. I'll come. If, if my experience is the result of my karma, good and bad, then how do you reconcile that with the, not the fact, the concept that God is the doer and I'm merely the instrument. Yes. We cannot. The only thing is because we do not feel that. So that God is the doer and I am merely the instrument, then you are a perfect karma yogi. That is the highest level of karma yoga. Let me quickly state three levels. Karma yoga also has levels. People don't understand this. First level of karma yoga, phalatyaga. Second level of karma yoga, karmatyaga. And third level of karma yoga, katritva tyaga. What does it mean? Phalatyaga means giving up the result. I am doing the work not because I want the thing for myself. I am doing the work as worship of the Lord. So the results I consign unto the Lord. So renunciation of the result, mentally. Second, higher level than this. Renunciation of the work itself. Not that I will not do the work. I will do the work, but I have no more choice regarding the work. I do not... That's why Vivekananda said about this second level. Neither seek nor avoid. We have choice. Likes and dislikes about the work. But if it is all worship of the Lord, why should I say I will worship in this way and not worship in that way? That, he, that person really feels. So work becomes 
So it, it is a worship. And then third level is that Katritva um, Tyaga. I am not the doer also. That is difficult to understand now because we inevitably feel I am the doer and that comes of deep identification with the body and mind. At the third level one begins to clearly see nature is doing everything. God is doing everything through nature, through Maya. All impulses. Think about it. Where do our thoughts come from? From thoughts come speech. From thoughts come speech and action. But where do this, does the thought come from? We think I am thinking the thought. Not true. If you just watch a little bit, it bubbles up from unknown depths of our consciousness. Everything here is being done by nature. Bhagavad Gita says, Prakrityeva karmani kriyamanani sarvasha. Prakriti alone does every action here in, in the entire universe. I mean, scientists will be so happy. Bhagavad Gita says, absolutely correct. Everything here is done by nature. Not one thing is done by you, the conscious being. Ya pasyati tathatmanam akartaram sapasyati. The one who sees oneself in that way, that I am not the doer, nature is the doer. That person sees the consciousness within does not do anything. Here he does not bring God into the equation at all. But the devotee will say, God does everything. That was the whole meaning of the song we started with. Shakoli tomari icha. All is thy will, my divine mother. You do thy work. People say, I am doing the work. You, you make the lame cross mountain ranges and you trap the, the elephant in a swamp. You, you give somebody, you make somebody enlightened, Brahma Jnana, and the other you plunge into the, uh, the mires of samsara. We think we are doing it. I am a great saint by my efforts. That person is a sinner. No, ultimately you will see God is behind everything. That's fun for the enlightened person, not so much fun for the sinner who's trapped. But even that so-called sinner is also nothing other than God. That person is also ultimately safe. So at that level, no more. Uh, that um, I am the experiencer of the results. You will not think I am the doer. I am not even the experiencer. You are already free. That's the highest level of um, karma yoga. Work and worship, first level. Work is there and worship is there, first level. Second level, work as worship. It, I know it's work, but I'm now trying to see it as worship. It's a practice. Third level, work is worship. We, we have a slogan for this, work is worship. Not so easy at all. If work is worship, we would always feel that we are, um, you know, um, we are always as good as med deep meditation. Then. You really should go for the snacks. <laughs> Chalo, we, we'll take it up later. Keep, uh, hold, on, hold on to your question. We'll talk about it as we go along. I can see that if I don't go, nobody's going. <laughs>